Welcome everybody, Joan Ariel, President of the Petaluma Museum. So happy to see you here at Beyond, the Smithsonian Exhibition. Uh, we end July 4th, so uh, we're kind of wrapping up our speaker series, and boy, we've got a great one today. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple of quick things. First off, uh, uh, a very special thank you to uh, two volunteers in the back who, who uh, a lot of this probably wouldn't happen if it wasn't for them, you know, and all their energy and positivity. Uh, I want to recognize Mary Rowe back there. And Mary, thank you. And of course, our superstar, uh, Liz Cohey. Liz was instrumental for putting this panel together, and we're, we're very grateful for that. Uh, and again, before we get started, another special guest with a special annou announcement. I want to introduce uh, uh, Lynn over there from the Sonoma County Astronomical Society. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Lynn Nelson, President of Sonoma County Astronomical Society. Now I'm going to bring to your attention that we're having a star party tonight. Right across the street here, we'll be looking at Saturn and its nearest moon, Titan, and uh, some double stars, and if the weather's conditions allow, if it's clear out, come on down about quarter of nine, nine o'clock. And I want to bring to your attention that one of our superstars, including myself and Eric over there, and wearing a super t-shirt, you've got to have. We have a limited supply of them. They're going fast, but if you left, they're right here, $15. And the hats are $12. And we also sell Mary Grossman uh, decals, so you can personalize the hat with comets, planets, whatever you want to put on it. Really cool, and you have a blinking light or a steady light or no light. You draw attention to yourself at night. It's all great. You got to have one or two. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Thank you, man. Hey. Well, I'm really excited about this uh, presentation today. You know, we've covered a lot of different topics as far as this exhibition, but for me, this was this one's just just wonderful. Uh, uh, I've always been a big science fiction fan, and for all of us who can't be astrophysicists or astronauts or, or work for NASA, you know, this is where I think our imagination comes into place, and I just happen to have this 1939 astounding uh, comic here, and, you know, we look at something like this, and, you know, what, what was the past, you know, what, how did we foresee the future, and how did we foresee science and space travel, and it's amazing where, you know, some areas, you know, we kind of, we're pretty darn close. If you know, you look at Dick Tracy's, uh, you know, television uh, uh, c communicator watch and our iPhone and you know those type of things. So, so I think it's certainly kind of science fiction is, uh, in a lot of ways, turned into science fact. Uh, so we're very, uh, extremely honored to uh, have these three gentlemen here today. You know, really leaders in, in their industry, and we've got some great books here uh, that I'm sure they'll be willing to sign for you if you if you'd like to purchase those. And uh, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce. Our distinguished guests, Peter Beagle, Michael Crawford, and Richard Lupoff. Thank you very much. I think that our host has just given our speech for us. <laughs> we'll just sign books and leave. Everybody sign books and leave. We always let we always have Michael go first. Yes. That's why I sit in the middle. Um, the topic for today is, uh, what's the topic for today? <laughs> you were yesterday's World, Tomorrow, or hand me from... down my jetpack, I'm having lunch on Mars. <laughs> that was actually uh, was Dick that suggested the title. I suggested the kind of general topic, saying let's talk about the things that didn't happen. And uh, Dick came up with, what, you said that it was, as far as you know, somebody else used it first. Uh, somebody else world used tomorrow. Yesterday's World, of Tomorrow, but hand me down that's my yours. jetpack, that's one of <laughs> so what we're going to talk about is all of the things, well, some of the things that were prophesied and believed to happen and uh, that some or other haven't come true. And the, the flip side of that is what is there that 10 years, 15 years ago was very common and that you don't see anymore. You probably haven't missed them because something else was taking its place. But let me give you an example just to start with. Phone booths. When was the last time you saw an act? Well, some of the booths are still there, but there aren't any phones there. Because who could have predicted that the cell phone would become ubiquitous? How many people here have cell phones? With them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was once watching an old Star Trek from the 60s with a small boy who said, you know, when Kirk put down his communicator, oh, they had cell phones back then? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, quick introduction. To us. Richard will introduce himself, then I will introduce myself, and then Peter needs an introduction. Well, I, actually, we were introduced, but um, yeah, I was sort of the, the standard model kid 
geek science fiction fan whose heroes were the science fiction writers of that era, Ray Bradbury, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Isaac Asimov, and, and that whole generation of, of wonderful people. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe someday, if I'm really lucky, I will get to emulate my heroes. And I got to do it, which, which was a, a great pleasure for me in many ways. Um, I've also sort of branched out because writing only science fiction worked only for a certain period of time and up to a certain extent for me. And I, I've, I've been doing a lot of other books of other sorts in more recent years. But I still have my affection for science fiction. and. I, I still revisit that genre now and then, and uh, do another story or another book. So, Peter. I went to the Bronx High School of Science in New York, where I was truly one of the worst students they ever had, except in English and history. My father was a history teacher, and I read absolutely everything, which included science fiction. Never mind the best way I can describe my an aptitude for science is to say that once, to everybody's great astonishment, I got 90 on a test, which was inconceivable. <laughs> and my best friend and I were studying it very carefully, going over it, and my friend finally said, we well, you know, Dr. Joseph's handwriting is pretty sloppy. Maybe that's a four. <laughs> and I, that made much more sense. <laughs> to this, I read. Clark and Bradbury and Asimov and everything else, as much as anything, because they were there. They were fiction. They were books. So I read them. And I remember my parents didn't forbid it. They were curious about it. And I remember explaining earnestly to my parents that, after all, um, Isaac Asimov had a PhD. You know, so you know, it wasn't some hack. But they didn't care if I read some hack or not. And I read a great many hacks. And I learned a great deal from third and fourth rate writers that's come very useful over the years and what not enough to do. But my, the best way I can put it is that I was very fond of Paul Anderson, whom I'd read as a boy, and his stories were being serialized, his novels, and we got to be good friends when I was grown. And I can remember, um, Paul was one of the very few writers who could go back and forth between fantasy and pure hard science fiction. Very few could manage that well. And I remember telling him, you know, I've read fantasy, I mean, we read fantasy novels of yours that you wrote close to 50 years ago, and they still hold up marvelously. They still make me wish I'd done that. And I still can't make head or tail out of your science fiction stories. And Paul laughed and said, well, 50% isn't bad. <laughs> but it's still so. I read science fiction, but almost with a kind of nostalgia that we're discussing here. We were looking over the list of things that, well, forgot what got me. It was not even so much the things that didn't happen as the things that left us. And we were, we were simply talking about those, ranging from telephones, telephone booths, to newspapers. It's a plain paper. And then I said, the automat. <laughs> I love the automat. It was my favorite, my favorite. For those of you who ever lived in New York or Philadelphia, you know, the automat was such a wonderful place. You put nickels in, and you turned a knob, and a window lifted, and there was your dish. Jimmy Durante used to have a standard line that, you know, nobody would pick up today. I put a I put a slug in the corner, in the, the slot at the other back, you know what came out? The manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've always missed the other back when I'm in New York. I just passed by where they used to be. But there are the things that, that did and didn't happen, and why they did and didn't happen, are basically our subject today. Yeah, we'll get into that, hopefully. Yes, well, and there are things. I, I can't introduce myself. It's my turn. <laughs> no, it's him. My name is Michael. He's not always that. <laughs> Sometimes I, 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 was, I was simply going to add a couple of things that we don't have anymore. We used to have, like um, uh, poliomyelitis. Yeah. We don't have that anymore. That's fine with me. 
there are a few other things that are that are gone of similar nature. Smallpox. I used to Small, see people. We don't mind not having smallpox marks. marks. I went to when I was. Uh, it was common. Thirteen. I think between twelve and thirteen, I went to camp. I to New York, and my parents used to get rid of me for the summer by sending me to camp. And I went to a camp I really hated. So I told them I'm not going back there. And so I did. The next year I did something else. And the year I didn't go, sixty something percent of the kids at the camp got polio. <laughs> including one of my good friends who lived directly across the street from me, and I used to go visit him in his wheelchair. So by sheer luck, and, and being the kind of person that hates everything, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to tell an anecdote that has nothing to do with, with anything we're talking about, because it reminded me of this, we're talking about Paul, the way I met Paul Anderson. He was at a science fiction convention years ago, and I, his daughter Astrid, and I met her, she's very cute, and she was maybe... You know, 19, 20 years old, and I was in my 30s, but what the hell. So I came on to her because that's what men do. With and after, <laughs> after we flirted for a while, she said, you know, there's something you should know. And I said, what's that? She said, I'm 13. <laughs> <laughs> and I jumped back, and she smiled at me, and she said, what's the matter, superstitious? <laughs> and, uh, I've, always, I've always, in the other sense of the word, loved her for that. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I, I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was either 10 or 11 years old and have not varied from that, which explains my extreme poverty. And, and, uh, but uh, I wanted to be a playwright. And I grew up in New York and I knew actors and actors and a couple of playwrights, you know, the adults. You know. And then I went in the army and I, when I got out of the army I came back and I moved to Greenwich Village and I fell in with a very bad crowd, science fiction writers. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, Come on, just do it once. It's easy. <laughs> and so for 20 years about, I wrote science fiction, and I still like like Nick. I still do occasionally. I love it, but I've switched over. Most of my actual books are now mysteries, like mysteries and science fiction. That's my background. Okay, now I'll shut up. So, Peter, as you were saying, <laughs> was I? Yes. <laughs> well, the thing that strikes me, of course, are the things we couldn't imagine. Happen, the things that even missed the science fiction writers. Remember, we I just old enough to have caught the last days of the pulp science fiction magazines. For the first saw the work of Robert Silverberg, Robert Sheckley, Philip K. Dick, they were all in these last pulps. And there still were what we call bends, bug eyed monsters, on the imaginary surface of planets that couldn't possibly have had a surface like that, let alone um, women running around and next to nothing. Right. They all had, in their tentacles, they grasped a woman who would have instantly died because she didn't have any air supply. But right. <laughs> they always had tentacles. Tentacles seem to have grown, uh, evolved on all planets you've ever heard of. <laughs> oh, the wonders of science will never cease. Uh, I just read something this morning about a star that I, I don't remember which one, you know, Parkeon 817-B. Uh, there is a jet coming from the star. Now, that's fairly common. The stars will, will you know, emit some kind of jet of gas. And, but they've analyzed it, and they've discovered it's a jet of water. Out of a star is coming a jet of water. They have not yet explained this, but they've checked the facts, and that it indeed is uh, H2O that's coming out of the star. Uh, I think what goes around comes around. In, in science, we've got a real astronomer over here who's probably going to steam will be minute coming over no, years. A real amateur astronomer. I'm not a professional. Okay. I wish I was. Even even so, um, in the 19th century, there was a theory. It originated in, in the world of theology, oddly, called the multiplicity of worlds. Anybody ever hear of the multiplicity of worlds? Right. It was the idea that. Well, all of these other planets were just being discovered then. And a, a major theologian decided, well, God wouldn't waste all of those worlds. If he creates all those worlds, there must be people on all of them. And I don't think they had tentacles. I think his idea was, was that they were just like us. Um, Probably white and spoke English. That's <laughs> <laughs> what congressman said some time ago. Well, if English was good enough for Jesus. <laughs> um, this, this notion 
was, was taken over by early science fiction writers at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, where we had the notion that, that all of the planets were more or less like Earth, only more so. Like, like Mars was, was a lot like a high desert, dry and chilly, but mm, kind of like Earth. And, and Venus inside all those white puffy clouds must be, because it's closer to the sun, obviously, must be warmer. And the clouds mean it must be very moist. So there are probably lots of swamps and jungles with large animals in them on Venus. And all of, all of the planets were more or less like Earth. Um, the early science fiction writers of that era went with this. I was just reading a book that, that I was asked to, uh, to read for a reissue, uh, write, write a review of it, a 1941 novel by Edmund Hamilton, um, in, in which this, this theme is carried out in, in great detail. Uh, one of the things that he explains in this book is where the asteroid belt came from, which when we were school children, there was a fairly acceptable theory that there had been a planet there. Yeah, and something nasty up. had happened and it yeah. blew up. And all of these little things are the leftover debris from that because explosion. Because they discovered atomic energy and had a great war. <laughs> That's not, yeah, that, no, that was, the, that was a very common belief. In, uh, well, this, this is in that, that Hamilton story, uh, which has a lot of other things explained, including the origin of the planets, which again, this is a theory that was taught in elementary school when I was a little kid, that another star long ago happened to pass near our star. And the gravity, the mutual gravity of these two stars of these two stars pulled large blobs of matter out. And then the other star kept on going, and our, our sun stayed here. And so each of these two stars developed a family of planets out of these blobs of matter that were pulled out of, out of the other star, or out of, their, out of its own star, in this near cosmic collision. This was serious theory. This was well believed and logical. Um, a logical extension of this notion tells us that there are very, very, very few planets in the universe because they're only created when two stars come close enough to each other to pull out blobs and chunks of matter, not close enough to collide because then you just have one super giant star and not far enough apart that they, they just sort of wave as they go by. But they're just that right distance in these chunks get pulled out by mutual gravitational attraction. And then following that, over millions of years, the blobs and chunks coalesce into planets. This is in this Hamilton novel. Of course, any serious scientist would now tell you that theory is totally debunked. Mm -hmm. And what we have learned in recent years is that all stars have planets. Well, if not all, and certainly, certainly very, very many of them. And most stars are double stars, which was not known until recently. Yeah. So what we see here, and this is yesterday's world of tomorrow, the idea of traveling around to all the other planets, and they're all more or less like Earth. Uh, this one's a little bit chillier. This one's a little bit wetter. This one's whatever. In this, in this Edmund Hamilton book, which is truly wonderful, but in, a, in a bonkers, bizarre way, <laughs> Pluto is, of course, there were nine planets in those days, right? In Hamilton's earliest stories, there were only eight. Then there were nine. If he were alive today, they'd be back to eight. What goes around comes around. Okay? But in 1941, Pluto was a planet. And because it was so far from the sun, it was covered with ice. And the only creatures on there looked kind of like abominable snowmen, because they needed a lot of fur to stay warm. Just like Earth, only different. Now, one more point, and then I'll shut up. These guys are coming. <laughs> To, to re, uh, return to my theory of what goes around comes around. Mars, in, in the works of Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, he wrote a big series of books took place on Mars starting in 1912 and up through his death in 1950. He kept doing new installments of the series. Mars was dry and chilly, but not so dry and chilly that it was uninhabitable. The atmosphere was thin. But there was an atmosphere. And there were dry riverbeds 
that were the remnant of the ancient seas and rivers of Mars, which have all now dried up. Well, all serious astronomers for the next 75 years said, this is a lot of hooey. Mars has always been cold and dry and had very, very little atmosphere. Until comes the year 2000, and we discover that Mars has dry riverbeds and the valleys that were created by huge water flows. And there used to be oceans on Mars. And it used to be warmer. And it used to have a thicker atmosphere than it has now. And where did all the water go? And where did all the air go? That's to be resolved. But it turns out that the 1912 image of Mars, which 50 years later was debunked, 50 years after that has now been undebunked and turns out to have been spot on accurate. Always trust science fiction <laughs> <laughs> I've got a list here. I'm going to read this, just throwing these things out, and then we'll get the individual ones, I assume. I've got categories. I did this this morning in my sleep, so something <laughs> weird may come out of here. Uh, the categories are the future that isn't, wild surmise, missing from the present, going, that's stuff that isn't missing yet, but surely will be, and surprise, stuff that 20 years ago you didn't know existed, and now you can't live without. I'll just go through the list, I won't discuss them. Oh, incidentally, if anybody has a question at any time, if any of us raise your hands so we can ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there's also a thing called who, with a list of people that, that, that we may have been looking for. Okay, the future that isn't. Flying cars, individual jetpacks, trips to Mars, we should be doing that by now, daily. Uh, colony on the moon, I don't know why the hell we don't have one as a matter of fact. Space travel in general, world peace, cancer cure, liver growth, and household robots. Mm -hmm. Which are getting kind of close to what we don't really know. Not long now. Yeah. Wild surmise, things that, that were stapled to science fiction that it still looks like we don't know how the hell we're going to do them. Faster than light drive, teleportation, Androids, an android, the classic definition of science fiction, a robot is made out of metal and goes up. An android is made out of flesh and blood, but it's artificially created. That's the actual definition of it. Or it's a telephone. An android, that's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> droid X. And truly intelligent robots. Well, then you have to get to defining truly intelligent human beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a delicate point. That's right. <laughs> Some of these wonderful items about uh, we, we've discovered the missing link to the intelligent people with us. If we're quoting Wiseman, Mahatma Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, missing from the present things that used to be phone booths, typewriters. You can still get a typewriter, but you've got to go out of your way. Mm -hmm. Tape recorders, LPs, cassette and eight tracks and CDs, gone. Uh, LPs are coming back. We just had a discussion about that. But, but, uh, going. Pagers, fax machines, home phones, DVDs, law books, reference books on paper of any kind, newspapers, that is paper newspapers, uh, paper books in general, paper magazines, desktop computers are on their way out, privacy is rapidly disappearing, <laughs> department stores are going, and many diseases are either going or gone. To make up for that, there are old diseases that are coming back because we've misused various drugs and they don't work anymore. Surprise, things that 20 years ago you would not have known, you could not have predicted, would have been, maybe if you were brilliant science fiction writers like us. You <laughs> Cell phones, cheap wristwatches. Who would have guessed 30 years ago that you could buy a wristwatch for $9? Mm -hmm. Well, who would have guessed you get one in a box of cereal? That's right. <laughs> I've got, one, I've got a, one of these things that... They, they, anyway, um, cheap calculators. Cereal, they glow in the dark. The first calculator I bought, because I was one of those geeks that liked to have a calculator, would do various simple uh, scientific stuff, and, and it cost... And I was so proud to be able to get it for only, I think it was $119. And they give them away. Uh, cheap calculator. Time-altering TV. GPS, satellite radio or TV, the internet, email, so now we're going to go through some internet stuff, email, Netflix, YouTube, Facebook, computer games, and internet-based phones with video. I was just talking about that. I talk to my brother every day. He lives in New York. 
And I go to my computer screen, turn it on, and there's this ugly face staring at me. It's very pretty. <laughs> staring at me. And we talk forever, and then we want to, and then we hang up, and it's absolutely free because it's over the internet. Contact lenses, laser surgery, endoscopic surgery, uh, transplants. And that's, that's the end of the list. But if anybody has anything that suddenly comes to mind, Transplants, the transplants were talked about in science fiction from time to time. I seem to remember transplants are artificial. No, but I, I don't think anybody's sort of taking somebody's heart and putting it in somebody else except Frankenstein. Well, the transplants generally involve removing the brain of yes. a beautiful newborn young woman <laughs> and putting it into the into the into the head of a giant ape. You have to <laughs> the brain of a criminal. <laughs> you know, you go drunk. Your, your comment about world peace make, makes me think of so many science fiction stories that predicted planetary societies. In other words, everybody getting along. Good and luck the, with that. And, and yeah. the, the other side of the spectrum of all the science fiction stories that predicted the entire destruction of the planet by idiots like us. So I'm always struck by a line of Will, Will Rogers who said sometime in the 20s, it's not so much that people are ignorant, it's that they know so many things and ain't so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you, can, can I ask that? Yes, please. Do you venture to think 20 years from now, what are, what are new things that we can't even imagine? It, but your, imagine, your minds might think, of something that you put in your science fiction writing? My old friend, I love, uh, this is, this is, excuse me for thinking that, my old friend Isaac Asimov was asked once at a convention, somebody said, do you think that there are laws that we haven't discovered yet? And Isaac said, yes, there probably are, but if so, we do not know them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. It's, I would give a great deal of mentioning it today if I could get hold of a sweatshirt that once was easy to get my hands on. This was back, it was to, to publicize an album by the Firesign Theater, comedy uh -huh. troupe. And this it was pushing one particular album and set across the front of it, everything you know is wrong. <laughs> Somehow I've always found that easier and easier to grasp as time passes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's true. Well, everything you know will be wrong 20 years from now. Yes. Absolutely. But it'll be true again in 50 years. But it'll be true again. <laughs> That's why, for instance, that I'm perfectly delighted with a scientific discovery that dark chocolate, mind you, the dark bittersweet type with a lot of cocoa in it, and red wine are very good for your heart. And I intend to hang on to that bit of science <laughs> even after it's disproved. As true. But, but so many things, Michael, you mentioned earlier, why don't we have colony on the moon? Why, why can't you go to Mars? Uh, so much of engineering and scientific development, I won't say progress, because that gets people into quarreling about values, <laughs> but so much scientific development is a question of will, a question of will and finance. When, when the Cold War was, was very intense in the early 1960s, and John Kennedy said, we're going to the moon by the end of the, of the decade, and we're going to do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. He didn't do that because he loved science. He did it because he didn't want the Russians to get there first. <laughs> and that was the reason why we went to the moon. And once we got to the moon, and the Russians hadn't got there yet, and our, ast our astronaut, yeah, we won the race. You don't keep running. You go take a shower. <laughs> and so what we did technologically was go take a shower. What we need, uh, I, I think it was William James who spoke of the moral equivalent of war. Mm -hmm. What we need is the moral equivalent of the Cold War, which we don't have. We're doing the best we can for the terrorists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they don't have any technology, so no, we don't have to outdo them. Uh, no, so they're in a great we, need, we need another Soviet. <laughs> <laughs> there you bring People, great back to I the USSR. This, when, when, when Sputnik was launched, yes. My reaction was, oh, great, and everybody thought I was crazy, but I knew what would happen. Not precisely, I mean, you know, but I knew that we would have to outdo them, which meant that Billy Lay would finally get to the moon. He didn't quite. He didn't quite. He died, like, what was it, like three weeks before the moon? Yeah. Yeah. Well, following up on what this lady said, uh, would you tell us some of the predictions you're making in your books for the future? 
I'll, I'll stop predicting the future. Yeah. Let, me, let me see if I can think of any that other people are predicting. What, is, what are we predicting for the... Uh... <laughs> Well, I just, I, just, I just had to revise this. What, I just had to revise a book that that um, was like 20 years old, and I discovered I had to cut out three different scenes that had phone booths in them <laughs> because people would go, "Ha ha! Look how old-fashioned he said in the future." <laughs> I've always liked the scene in my my favorite of the Star Trek movies, the fourth, where the engineer Scotty, who needs to make a computer, work for the computer speaks to it, because that's what he's used to, and then understand. It's the 20th century, after all. Oh, a keyboard. How quaint. <laughs> well, there, there is a, a novel, plus a couple of short stories in this book. Uh, the novel is called The Forever City, but it deals with the exploration of, again, what we have discovered in recent years. We used to think there were these nine planets, or maybe eight, or maybe nine, or maybe eight. And then we discovered there are a lot of other bodies out there around the orbit of Pluto, uh, some larger than Pluto. And then we discovered that there are further shells of matter, so-called Oort cloud. I believe there are, there are bits of matter even farther out than that. Uh, lots of chunks, individually probably pretty small and diffuse, but there are so many of them that collectively their mass is very substantial. And the idea of going out and exploring these bodies, I find fascinating. Now the question, the question that always gets asked <coughs> when some, some brave technophile member of Congress says, we should build a spaceship to do this, or we should build, we should investigate that, we should try to learn this, <coughs> the answer, the objection is always raised, well, that's very nice, but we have problems right here on Earth. Uh, we have hungry people. Why don't we feed the hungry people first? Now, the people who say this generally don't want to feed the hungry people anyway. <laughs> they don't know it. They just want their taxes to be cut. But, but this is the objection that's raised, and it is a very serious point, and it deserves a serious response. And the serious response is, if you take that attitude, there are always matters of greater urgency. And there will always be matters of greater urgency. And we will never go out and do, go to, go to the moon and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. We'll never do them. If we make this our yardstick, is there something more urgent? Now this doesn't mean we shouldn't feed the hungry. It means we should feed the hungry and we should explore the universe. It also means that you should remember that when you're doing things that you cannot predict the outcome, you might discover something like, oh, America? Yes, right. Well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have all the miniaturization that we have today if it hadn't been, again, this goes back to the 1960s, the Soviets had better, bigger and more powerful rockets than we did. So they could build their spaceships out of electronics that had tubes and wires in them. <laughs> And our rockets were not as powerful as theirs, and we couldn't boost that heavy a load. So we had to figure out how to make the electronics smaller and lighter. And that's why you have a cell phone today. If we'd had more powerful rockets in the 1960s, your cell phone would be this big if you had one. <laughs> <coughs> and that's why, yes. of course, that's why, of course, a fair number of people in Africa have been killed over the the development of the mines and the search for Colton, which is an element that goes into cell phones. And it's only found in Africa, apparently. Anyway, it's fairly rare. And there, there are always side effects to everything. There's one thing I actually have learned in a long and silly lifetime, is that everything costs, one way or another, whether it's money, or side effects. I was a great fan of the Green Revolution. You know, I still am. The whole notion of making it possible to feed everybody on the planet struck me as the most wonderful thing I've ever heard of. But there are costs, not simply financial ones. There are costs even to the planet. What the great capitalists of our country have discovered is that if you're really clever, somebody else will pay those costs. Yeah. Yes, you, know, you can pollute and leave it to somebody else to have to clean it up. Immensely practical. 
I just found myself thinking about a couple of the things that you might sort of might think about spinning out in the next couple of decades are things that seem to be kind of emerging now. One is artificial intelligence, and then on a much smaller scale, things like domestic robots, Ubers and Scubas. Where do you think those are going to be going? Those two things. Well, okay, first of all, as far as domestic robots, you can buy a robot vacuum cleaner now. We have one. You have? Okay. You just can't clean it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, our friends in, in Japan did something very clever when they developed the first fairly plausible humanoid robot. It's called Asimo, and it looks a lot like a human being, and it can actually walk like a human being. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. And they designed it to be smaller than the average person and to walk with a slightly bent over humble posture so that people don't imagine this huge clanking monstrosity lurching around saying, kill, kill. <laughs> <laughs> you see this, <clears throat> this, this, but, humble little, this humble little thing, they say, you pet it on the head and you say, go do the dishes. <laughs> kill, kill. <laughs> Yes, I've always been a fan of stories with unintended consequences. You know, you make a wish for world peace and it turns out everyone's dead or <laughs> something like that. But something that science fiction has always promised us and I think really has come true, but not for everyone, is technology creating leisure time. Uh, who would have dreamed that the leisure time would be unemployment? <laughs> or, the le or, you know, there, we have all these wonderful medical miracles that are available mostly to the rich and not, not to everyone. That's something that... I don't think I ever saw accounted for in science fiction. Uh, not that I'm accusing anyone, but I just think it, it was, you know, we dreamed about jetpacks. We really do have jetpacks, just not for you and me. Well, actually, we have jetpacks, but they're only good for 30 seconds, so don't get too high. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. The jetpack is a gadget. It's not, there is no political. Sure, understood. But there is, there is that whole social issue that, um, society turning into something like the later Roman Empire with a whole large pool of perpetually unemployed people living you know, on the dole and the country trying to figure out what to do with them and how to keep them. It's a, a, and I really do believe that in my paranoid moments that the intention is to create a permanently available pool of cheap labor. In that case, we'll never have the robots because we need some infection. Well, the, the, on the other hand, you know, if we do develop the robots, we'll sell them. I robots. predict it. I, as a matter of fact, I predicted in a book uh, a while ago, like 15 years ago, that the way things were going, some people were going to get fantastically rich. I know this would never really happen, but some people would get fantastically <laughs> rich, and most people wouldn't have jobs. And what that would create is another class of servants. That if you want a job, this guy that makes two billion dollars a year will hire to have body servants. Or, you know, and um, a friend of mine uh, a few years ago who became a chef. She went to chef at school and became an actor chef and, and worked at I don't know if you remember Narcisse, but she worked at Narcisse for a while. When we went back to New York, uh, she was looking for a job, and uh, somebody offered her a, a, a chance to work for some extremely rich people and uh, in Long Island. And so the first thing that she took the test of cooking, and she's really good at that, so she cooked and she won that. And then she had an interview, and at the end of the interview, the person who was interviewing, who I think was the butler or something, looked at her and he said, Jess, you're a very good chef, but we don't think you're quite ready for personal service. Uh, in other words, you're not quite subservient, and she wasn't quite subservient enough. That was, uh, she would have not liked anybody telling her what to do. But there's the whole issue of life extension, as they call it now and 70 being the new 40, and so on. <laughs> what happens then, you have a whole lot of essentially retired people with a whole lot of leisure time, whether or not they can pay the rent is another matter. The whole issue of the horrors with this new crop of baby boomers retiring and... Are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> See, the three of us and other people like us don't really get to retire. 
Um, you're right, yeah. don't retire for they two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, you don't make enough money to retire. That's the basic unless you're, Yeah, that's the rule. And the second, well, my feeling, I don't know if these two gentlemen will agree with me, but I've spent, you know, 30 years learning how to write. It would really be a shame for me to stop just when I'm getting good at it. <laughs> <laughs> we all, we'll all say on our deathbeds pretty much the same thing that Jean Renoir reports his, his father, Pierre Renoir, saying that he was over and over when he was dying at 90 or 91, mad, and I was just learning to paint. <laughs> yeah. We all said that. Well, uh, Count Basie, <clears throat> great musician, toward the end of his life, uh, was partially disabled, used a power chair and such, and uh, was asked by an interviewer, you have your money, you have your place in the history of modern popular music, why do you keep doing this? Why don't you retire and just go relax someplace and enjoy life? And he says, I would rather be a musician than a former musician. Uh -huh. And I would rather be a writer than a former writer. Even, saying, if, even if I had you know, a ton of money, or even if I had a pound of money. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that, that is in any of this sort of art, music, writing, uh, painting, uh, if you really don't love it enough, that you're going to keep doing it regardless, you probably would have dropped out at the age of 30 and not at the age of 60. I learned something from Basie, by the way, as a writer, because it was often commented upon that his solos, when he took them at all on piano, were very lean, very spare. There were jokes about it. Um, Basie said, when this came up, it's taken me 50 years to learn what notes not to play. Yeah. That I understand altogether too well. There's, a, a, there's still a feeling in the world that when you get over 70 that you're useless. You know, they wrote a science fiction movie about this, I forget the name of it, but where there's green money, they, they grind up the old people and make money. <laughs> for the green. There's another one. What's and, the one that... that and, Logan's, Logan's, Logan's run. Only was 30, and, not 70. And, and hopefully we're getting past that stage and realizing well, that you can be very creative years. when you're old. It doesn't make any difference how old you are. Well, it's, I think it's going to increasingly happen uh, once we get through the present period. The present agree we happen that people don't retire. I certainly don't retire. One of the things I've discovered, as I'm sure you all know, is that you retire at 65 and you'll be dead by the time you're 68. I had an interesting experience because I, when I moved to Petaluma, I went out to the Buck Institute that studies yeah. aging yeah. and the, and the, and the uh, good that aging, aging people can offer the world. I asked for a job and they said, you're too old. <laughs> <laughs> That's but great. it is, that it is just, great. That, I mean, that is an aspect of the future that we are looking at um, in our society that, that will, will change that way, that we'll have more older people, that will have more, uh, as I said, in basically, um, People, people without, you know, with, without, uh, I mean, it's kind of a dark vision, but people without jobs, without, well, there's no without purpose, not just old people, but, but a lot of people. Well, yeah, but and, age and will have nothing to without do with it. A sen yeah, without because if you've a, a got a skill that, that's needed, you'll yeah. still be needed. I mean, you could write quite an apocalyptic novel about well, thank you. You know, these societies. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, think, you know, spinning that out as, as Right, you know, futuristic writers. This is the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> all, all medical research and lifestyle improvements, and we learn to eat better. Not that we had such a great lunch today. That was, <laughs> right, that was my, my weekly indulgence. Um, <clears throat> improvements in surgery, improvements in medicine, improvements in diet, improvements in public sanitation, all the things we do to keep people from dying. <coughs> this is great. I mean, you don't you don't want to have to have eleven children, nine of whom will die before the age of twelve. Right? Although we're still up there in terms of mortality as a country. But but if you have eleven children and none of them die before the age of twelve, what does this do to the population? Well, a lot of people have not bothered to think about this. And if people, if 
if this new, new medication keeps you from dying of pneumonia at age 40, and keeps you from dying of uh, cancer at age 50, and keeps you from dying of, of diabetes at age 60, all of these things are wonderful <coughs> on an individual basis. And I can tell you right now, I would not be here today except for some wonderful pieces of medication and some amazing pieces of surgery that I have enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, this is creating a population that is, is increasingly loaded toward old people. And we have, in, in, well, you, you look at the bell curve shape, you, the bell shaped curve, the proverbial bell shaped curve of people by age. And you find that the big bulge in it is moving over farther and farther and farther. What do you think in society? How do I, I we live? How do we make I, our country I work? don't think it matters. You don't think it matters? Well, I don't first, think of all, first of all, uh, the, the birth rate is slightly below the replacement rate in the United States right now. So it's not like we're going to be adding tremendous numbers of people that uh, people that are still That's here. I, mean, I, I said in the United States. Yeah. I said that. You heard me say that. <laughs> <laughs> that and it's slowly yeah. happening other places too. It's going to take a while. Well, well that's that's, 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 as people, as as uh, as countries get the, uh, the benefits of civilization, one of the things that happens is the preservation of as women get a certain amount of independence. Right. And as, as, women get the, as, as women get birth control pills, the birth rate. Michael, you, you hit the nail on the head. As uh, <coughs> birth control is made free and available, and yeah, that's right. you know, that's people avail the themselves of it, them. all of that will right. drop. But you know, if the sure. mindset of right. certain leaders of certain countries and such continues on its current path, you can kiss away those free condoms that are available that would prevent that. And you're going to add to that birth rate. Back in the 1950s, there was a Comedian who runs, popular, was pretty short, George Goebel. Yeah. But I always liked Goebel. There was a, a, something endearing about him. At one point, he very solemnly read that um, it was predicted that on this most recent Thanksgiving weekend, X number of people would die in automobile accidents. And in fact, the number so far was much smaller than predicted, and Goebel looked out at the audience and said, no, I don't want to name names. Some of you folks out there just ain't trying. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, I was reading an article about China, for example, and you know that the whole gender issue there and yeah. the next generations is going to be predominantly male. And what is that, how does that affect the culture and society where all this, they, like they're saying, they won't even have the ability to have female mates just because of, you know, statistically not. They'll come over here and take out women. Like yeah, I just think they're talking about the testosterone and the, the aggression and what's the result of this. This is a great question. What, what do you think? Yeah, it, well, if you find... No, I'm asking you. Come yeah, on. well, it's hard. To, I, I, I tend to agree with the, the, the article that you, it seems you got a lot of male, males, you know, banding together. And I, I can certainly sense more testosterone flowing, you know, maybe more aggressiveness. Uh, this it seems that it seems well, to be... Considering that came about because China did not value the, the female <coughs> members, the female China women. Actually, it wasn't. So it's not, that's the oversimplification. Uh, China adopted the one-child policy. Right, but they always stupid. preferred to have a boy. There but was it a was, lot of tales out there about it was, that. Mm -hmm. It was the individual family. It wasn't China. In other words, um, Not a government the family now. said, if we can only have one child, it better be a boy because right. we're going to need somebody to support us in our old age. And everybody knows that women can't do that. <laughs> so they chose in, to have sons in, and not in daughters? China, yeah. So they chose how, how did they do that? They aborted the daughters. Ah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a dogging Well, left them out, left no, they didn't. That's yeah. one of those, yeah, and that's another one of these things that they just think we're, if we're looking at it's a trend, something that is happening where now that you can tell the gender of your your, you know, your, ch your child before it, well before it's born, and you can decide what, which whether you want to have your well, based on its sex. And this, you know, it's creating this problem. China and also I think in India. And if this, if this creates yeah, a country with a with a population of gender way out of balance, mm -hmm. it seems to me that this would cause the reversal of the attitude and that women would become highly valued because be there's a, a surplus of males, a shortage of females, and there like would the be competition. Press. 
Yeah. <laughs> right, saloons with dancing girls. Yeah. My, my, my family runs to boys, and so a girl is a big deal. And I can still hear my father saying on the phone to someone back in New York when the when he was telling him about the birth of my brother's daughter, saying with immense pride and scorn, anybody can have boys. <laughs> I've always run to girls myself. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting, <laughs> interesting story. My family was somewhat similar. I have a brother, no sisters, and he had two sons and no daughters. And my first child was a son, and my second was a girl. And I called my mother on the phone, and, and she said, what is, what is it? Because she knew that, that, that my wife was in the hospital having the baby. And I said, it's a girl. And she said, Richard, that is a cruel joke. <laughs> And I called her back and I said, no, really, we have a girl. And she was just thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> so, so speaking of what we were talking about in terms of things that happened, things that were expected to happen, I used to have a Honda that, when you closed the door, automatically put the seatbelt yeah. over you. And I remember picking my favorite aunt up at San Francisco airport, taking her to my car, and when she got into the car, the seatbelt closed over her, she, she jumped for a moment, and then I explained to her, no, that comes with the car, it's okay, and she sighed and said, yeah. America Ganef. Yeah. <laughs> and for those, you know, for those who don't know, um, Ganef by itself can mean gangster, thug, bad guy. America Ganef, on the other hand, means what won't they think of next? <laughs> well, again, back to we can do anything we choose to do. It's a question of political will and willing to make economic investments. Uh, again, in one of some of these old stories that I've been reading lately because the book reviewer asked me to do so, uh, a 1929 novel called Cities in the Air about building huge cities that would be in orbit around the planet. And of course, it's absolutely 29. 29. Absolutely silly and ridiculous until we get a thing like the International Space Station, which is not exactly a city in the air, but it's getting pretty damn close. Now, if we chose to develop that technology, question, what would be the purpose of doing that? And, and I really don't know. I, I don't have that answer. But if we chose to do that, we really could have whole cities in orbit. There's no technical reason. The only not to. the only problem with it would be it would be so expensive getting to work. Tell us Right. I mean, if it costs something like you know a million and a quarter dollars to put somebody in the city, he's going to have to be a very valuable person. Yes. And aside from that, what if they can get if they can get cheap? Right. Uh, cheap transportation to orbit, then clearly there probably will be cities in orbit. Yes, well, that, that's one thing, too, in science fiction. There's the giant space elevators and yeah. the wormholes that take you back and forth well, instantaneously. That's, the, the space elevators. But mostly space elevators. That they're, you, I, you just imagine this huge tethered cable with this thing that rides up and down. And I always think of, you know, like the, 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 the thing at Disneyland that carries you across the park sort of thing. But in terms of transportation in the future, there's so much that we have now, even 50 years ago, you could still theoretically see somebody take their horse and cart down Main Street in some smaller town. Whereas if you saw a horse nowadays, you don't, you don't live in people might not even know what it is. You don't live in Petaluma, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Southern California and I in we still Anaheim, have, we still have people and people were horses. amazed when I'd say, I would grow up, the school bus took me now to get to work and we'd go through miles and miles of cattle farms and it would be these green rolling hills with cows. And people have said to me, point blank, you're making it up, there are no cows in Anaheim. <laughs> Just as there are no more orange trees in Orange County, yes, once upon a time there were there was my cattle mother, there. My mother, as an immigrant child, went to school in, was raised in the South Bronx. Well, the South Bronx was basically country. And she used to fascinate me with stories from her childhood of walking to school an ordinary day and seeing a cow or this a goat. This was in the 20s, 30s? About, yes. yeah. They were normal. They were the, last, the last farm in Manhattan Island 
closed, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was 1932 or 1933. There was a farm on Manhattan as late as 1932. Well, again, the, the changes come about. I called my daughter as a child, uh, talking about her favorite television programs and asking her mother and myself, what were your favorite TV shows when you were kids? Oh, we, didn't, we didn't have any. TV? It. And she said, you didn't have any favorites? <coughs> no, we didn't have any TV. She said, oh, you must have been very poor. <laughs> <laughs> I know a 22-year-old kid How who still regards me as his guru, a guide to baseball before the designated hitter. <laughs> Eight teams in each league. Yes, I've explained about that. And football before two squads. I've explained about people who actually played 60 minutes and who had helmets with ear flaps, you know, that you, you wouldn't wear on a cold day. And that is, speaking of institutions which have disappeared, the water boy in the football game, the kid with the bucket and the ladle who would run out between plays and all the players would slurp down some water so they had to fall over from dehydration and then the kid would run back off to the sideline and they played play the next Don't need it anymore. Those players come off after three or four plays. The World Series will be played between Christmas and New Year's. When? What year is that? Is it 20 years from now. It gets later and later. Well, the indoor stadiums will be. And, and, at that, and at that point, of course, the you know, San Diego and Los Angeles will emerge completely. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it'll simply be a commute. Actually, but Northern players. California will be its own state by then. They actually have <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> but they, want, they actually have merged, they just don't admit it. There so are the, streets. There are streets, well, you know this, there are streets in Los Angeles that you can drive straight to the Mexican border without yes. paying. And there's streets, they're not highways, they're streets. The street Chris Slater wrote a story in which Los Angeles, we don't know it, but Los Angeles is secretly a giant, malevolent organism. <laughs> it's slowly eating everything around it. It's not a secret. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are things that I do believe will happen. And mind you, I lived to see a black president, and I thought my children probably would, but I really didn't think I would. And I really do believe that it's a very fine line between a functional robot, or android, and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. But I know that androids are being used more and more, for instance, in Japanese hospitals, Japanese hospices, for old patients seem to relate to them very well. Androids? Androids, they're essentially they're robots. Essentially robots. 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 And apparently they're, they're comforting, they're soothing presences. They know what to say when your doctor may fumble between soothing you and telling you the truth. They there, just do it better. There is, uh, way back, way back at, at, during World War II, uh, one of the beginning people in artificial intelligence was a guy named Tori. And he developed the Turing test, which is the way to tell when you finally got an a true artificial intelligence is when the intelligence can be in the other room and you can talk through something so you can't see what it is. And when, if you can't tell whether it's a human being or a robot by having a, a normal conversation with it and, you know, and they've just about got through that. And of course, the machine that can do this is still the size of this, uh, this Oh, but then, no, but then so were computers once. Well, then, again, story. When I got out of the Army, I got my first real job. This was 1958. I went to work in the computer business. And I was taking a programming course. The way you did computer programming in those days was to sit at a desk in a room with a pad in front of you and write the program, which you then turned in. Somebody would send off to a key punch operator Speaking of things which have disappeared, punch cards are gone. Punch cards. Punch cards. Yeah, punch cards. Punch cards. Yes. And those would be fed into the computer. You'd get a printout of the results and you'd find it on your desk the next day. And well, then they'd have to debug it. Then, the yes. Point. About halfway through the course, the instructor comes into class one day and he says, Would anyone here like to see a computer? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he arranged for us to get into the room to see the computer, which occupied an entire story of an office building. It was Univac 1. And in the middle of the floor, first of all, the, the, the operator's console 
was the giant whirler circle. <laughs> but the, in the middle of the room was this thing that looked like a small gray barn or a large garage, which had a door in, the, in, in, in one side with a glass panel and a rubber gasket around the door. And he says, want to see the memory? And everybody in our group said, yeah, sure, we'd like to. So the instructor says, okay, don't touch anything. And he opens the door and we walk inside and he closes the door. And he says, you are now standing inside the computer's memory. This computer has a very large memory. It can remember a thousand words at a time. <laughs> wow. Wow, indeed. But you thought um, you were appro in appropriately impressed back then. Oh, we were like, very impressed. Nothing well, we've ever seen, right? Univac 2 came out with a memory of 2,000 words. We thought, well, there's <laughs> nothing beyond this. Okay, now, probably everybody in this room has more computing power, not only in a cell phone, but in a battery-powered wristwatch. Speaking of things with yes. change. Anybody here ever wind his wristwatch anymore? When you when Right? I'm or, so glad they took that away from me. Or wind your alarm clock. clock before you go to bed. Wind and set the alarm clock. Anyway, there's more computing power in, in, in a wristwatch that you got out of a cereal box <coughs> than there was in, in your back one. Somebody gave me, because I'm such a nice guy, I couldn't have afforded it. Somebody gave me the first IBM personal computer PC. Oh. And they worked with floppy disks, had no internal memory, but worked with floppy disks that had. 750k on the disk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and my friend who gave it to me also said, "Well, we've got this new thing." Uh, he gave me first of all, gave me two floppy disk ports in it, and a special thing that could go up from 750k. It could do uh, like half a million. It was a very expensive and high thing. And I said, "Why are you giving me this? Why would I ever need that kind of memory? What am I going to do with it?" Uh -huh. yeah. And I was right. At the time, there was no programs were written that could use that kind of memory. I had a, a friend back in the old days who was a computer programmer, the first one, really the only one I ever knew, who worked at that time on mainframes, as they were called, yeah. for big companies. She said, I don't know that there'll ever be a computer revolution where everybody will have a personal computer, but if that does happen, and you get one, so the thing for you to remember and say over and over to yourself like a mantra is that, the computer is not my friend. The computer is not my friend. So if you say that enough, you'll begin to understand the basic relationship. Uh, speaking of something else that's disappeared, and I notice all three of you are wearing them, I have I probably have three wristwatches at home. I never wear them anymore. I don't. I when you ask people the time, they no longer look at their wrist. They pull, their the cell, day is. they pull their cell phone out because every cell phone, the first thing you see mm -hmm. is the time. Yes, we know that. And I, but I like my But I also I find, I mean, like I deal with kids a lot, they're very cognizant of what time it is. They don't wear a watch, their parents have cell phones, they have video games that they play with, their computers, the time is always there. But the sense of the passage of time now is so acute. You kind of have to know what you're doing every minute of the day, and you've lost that long sweep of time. Like summertime, those three months were endless. But yes. kids nowadays, they know what they're doing every hour of well, the day. They've got play dates. They've got play dates, dates right. games, yeah. lessons, whatever. And I think the loss of that is something that we wouldn't have anticipated because we always thought all this machinery was going to free us up for more time. And like we were saying, you have to be unemployed to be part of the leisure class now, and then you're busy looking for work. So. Which is why one of my favorite books to this day is a book by Robert Paul Smith called Where Did You Go? Out. What Did You Do? Nothing. And he described, he was growing up, mind you, in the Midwest semi-rural area. I'm growing up in the Bronx, and he's growing up in the 1930s. But all the same, it was absolutely ac accurate to my experience about what children yeah. did mm -hmm. and what they believed. Right. But I don't think we'll ever get that back because we constantly find Things as change. these new technologies and gadgets and stuff come along, you can't just send a kid out to play anymore. You, you, it, it's just That's another done. Yes. <laughs> never say never. Hopefully it would, but I, I, I have two cousins in Mill Valley and they can't eat, their, their time is so regimented. It's too late, for, it's too late for them, but it's like to just go out and play in the backyard. I have a, a, a nephew, 
and I sent them an email the other day. Which was like the first time I ever did it, right? Even some too sad, but I figure I sent him an email, and he replied to well, "Thank you very much." But at the bottom, it said, "You know, sent from Max's cell phone." Yes. Yeah. He was, there. He was at, uh, walking down the street, and he answered me. He texted me. That is kind of cool. What, but to get back to science fiction from all of that. Um, Anyone here remember a writer named Murray Leinster? Usually, yes, yes. You know, a 1946 story of his called "A Logic Named Joe." Mm -hmm. In 1946, ENIAC had just gone online. ENIAC was the first true electronic computer. It was designed for the army in order to compute firing tables for the artillery, as is typical of military hardware development. It went online in 1946, the war having ended in 1945. <laughs> so what are we going to do with this thing? I don't know, it must, it must be good for something since we don't have a war going on. So the two guys, the two main engineers, a fellow named Eckert and a man named Mockley, said, well, maybe we could find some commercial use for this. I don't know. They started a little, computer, a little company and they decided maybe they could build these things commercially. And their first machine was Univac 1. The whole thing comes from that. Leinster, in 1946, has this story, an, an astounding, called The Logic Named Joe, which not only predicts computers, but perfectly describes the internet. It, it doesn't use the same vocabulary we use for it today because the vocabulary didn't exist, because the internet didn't exist. Because computers didn't exist. Well, Google used to mean something completely different. Well, mm -hmm. it was it was absolutely spot on perfect. And you can come across copy. Shouldn't be too hard to find this. You will be you will Google flattergast. Google, Google is, a, is a word made up by a guy named Cantor, who was a mathematician. Yeah, he was, he was, he was a million million. He was no, that's a Google Plex. Yes. Um, Google. He asked a. a, a grammar school class of like third grade or something, he was trying to teach them numbers, and he said, one with a million zeros after it, we need a name for it. One of the kids in the class said, let's call it a Google, and he said, perfect name, we'll call it a Google. You to burn it. Now, let's, no, it wasn't. And he said, let's, now he was teaching them about, about uh, um, factors. He said, okay, so imagine a 10 with a Google of numbers after it. They decided the name for that would be Googleplex. That's where I came from. I remember learning that in like fifth grade science. I never knew that. I know what Google is, but I, I never knew how it came about. <laughs> that's another thing. That's turned, one thing, one thing I know this. Topology. He was very good on topology, and I was still fascinated by, by Moby strips and, and uh, Klein's bottles. Did you know Klein had a bottle? <laughs> well, I never saw him without it. There's a. There's a Marx Brothers movie, in which it's really early, which Groucho is marketing some gadget or other, saying to his the audience crowded around him, and it's so simple the child of four can operate this machine, and says to an aide out of the side of his mouth, "Run out and find me a child of four. I can't make a tail of this thing." <laughs> and it's almost literally true. I accept the fact. I think about this. Um, I can remember flying off to college, first time I'd ever flown from New York to Pittsburgh. I was 16. <coughs> My best buddy was with me, he was a bit older, he was 17. And we were graduated from high school, very literate. We were so hip. We were so cool. And there are there can't be a nine-year-old today who isn't hipper than we were we were then. In the same way, there are four-year-olds now who are much more computer literate than I'll ever be. And that includes the stuff that hasn't shown up yet, the stuff that will be happening in their lifetime. And, and in their lifetime will probably be becoming obsolete. The trick is not, I guess, not to become obsolete as a person. That's the trick. What I, what I see is how quickly things are getting outdated. I'm thinking of getting a cell phone, and I'm thinking, well, you know, so many changes coming along, and I think I'm going to have it for 10 years, but probably not, because the changes come much more rapidly than they did. Or <coughs> well, remember, the, the changes are only adding things. 
and uh, many times there are any things you don't particularly want. So check that you know, before you worry about upgrading your cell phone. There's a tag. There's a tag line that seems to exist only between me and a particular German friend who was at my house. We were reading in the newspapers that actress named Jean Peters had just divorced Howard Hughes, and she said in the interview, "Well, you know." Howard and I were married for 12 years. That's a long time in America. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Jürgen picked that up immediately, so did I, and to this day. And I'm 72, and he's 68 or 69, when we do talk on the phone. Somewhere in there, there'll be the solemn line, well, you know, that's a long time in America. <laughs> <laughs> Except it's a lot shorter. Now. I have one of these extremely fancy cell phones. And the only thing I use it for besides, and the thing is, it's not as good a telephone as the last one I had, but I can play Angry Birds on it. <laughs> and it's got an app where I can hold it up to the sky and it'll tell me what stars I would be looking at if it wasn't daylight. <laughs> well, it'll do it at night too, but that's the neat thing. Is well, it's become a toy. Oh, oh yeah. there's Mercury right there, you know, except that it's like very close to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> don't, worry about, don't worry about lasting 10 years. They don't last 10 no, years. No, no. <laughs> no. That's true. They also they don't last 10 years. And, yeah. and it's so right. hard to get one that's just a phone. I, tr I tried for this last time to get a phone that had no camera, no bells and whistles. I said, I wanted to be able to make a phone call. Oh, well, you know, we don't make this anymore, mm -hmm. is what the spring person said. We, so. we were trying, as a matter of fact, to definitely get a phone without a camera because there are places that you're not supposed to bring cameras. I think they've given up on that. Uh, I, I think, think they have too because you know, uh, some of the courtrooms that are, that are closed right. you're not supposed to bring a camera to the courtroom and you know you can bring your cell phone if it doesn't have a camera. But, uh, that was a few years ago. That was a few years ago. Now they've given up on it because all phones have cameras. But they are kind of fascinating now. Who knows? But because I mean a phone now is it's like a little this. computer. It, well, yeah. it's, it's also like this one one local locus amusement thing. You can read books, you can listen to music, you can play games, you can, you know, uh, you know some cool friends. And and I'm, one of, I'm one of the early users yes. of the iPad. And I really love to play iPad. <laughs> yeah. No, be, it's like, You're going to play Angry Birds on it bigger. We're <laughs> <laughs> using your phone to find out where you, where you are. I mean, I if, find if, a kid out there now that really can use compass to are. find where they where they need to be. Yeah. You know, if they were out camping, they could use a compass. One thing that's mm -hmm. happened, by the way, is that I know this, speaking of somebody who flies a whole lot, I used to, I used to come off long flights, cross-country flights, with a stiff neck from talking to the person in the seat next to me. I got into strange and wonderful conversations with neighbors. Now I notice I almost never talk to anyone because everybody's immersed either in Angry Birds <laughs> or their Kindle or any, any one of a dozen other things. I'm always surprised when I find myself talking to somebody sitting next to me. I think you could say the art of conversation. Is one one of the thing that the Kindle too. has done that I'm doing, I, I actually don't like much except Oh, this is a very interesting thing. I think I'll read it. Click, click, click. It's being downloaded. Now I've got it. I can read it. Don't have to. Of course, the bookstores don't like that very much. No. That's one thing that, speaking of being sent out to play in the park, which was the most common thing in the world, in my neighborhood, parents like mine, you know, would send their children to the park on Saturday morning, except for the kids coming home for meals. Not really expect to see them until Sunday night. You know, when there's homework and Jack Benny on the radio. In the same way, um, um, why have I gotten sidetracked? Oh, God, is that the first sign? <laughs> Second. <laughs> Second. <laughs> we talked about that only, um, only, um, the, yeah. uh, <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> did anybody ever see a movie called Cat Blue? Yes. Of course. There's a scene in it where Kid Shaleen goes into the, the hole in the wall, the secret, and into the bar, and this old man goes up to him and he says, Kid Shaleen, you remember me, kid? I'm old, 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 old and wanders off. <laughs> I laughed at it the first time I saw it, because I was 20 years old. <laughs> that would be funny. If you remember, I was mentioning a, a great lyric writer songwriter most people don't remember unless you've seen some version of some performance of Once Upon a Mattress. Um, His name was Marshall Bearer. He also wrote Cushioned His Old Age by writing the theme of the back of a taxi cab for 
Mighty Mouse. He was a great songwriter, and there's one song of his that I can't listen to, really. It's a song from the point of view of a man who knows, who knows now that he's losing what makes him him. He stopped a stranger on the street to say, you look like a kind person. What's my name? There's an absolutely terrifying song, and I don't really listen to it. It frightens the hell out of me. But at one time, you know, at one time there wouldn't have been such a song. I know a well, joke with that scene, but I won't tell it. <laughs> I'm not sure, Melora. I think we should think about wrapping up because we're yeah, we're right right hour. Hour. <laughs> Any last questions? We'll take questions. Well, my thought was, could you just quickly tell about your writing? Aren't these your books? These are our books. I mean, just really... We they are truly wonderful works of art, and <laughs> they will improve your mind and make you healthier and happier, and all of your pimples in your face will disappear. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. <laughs> Is it possible to summarize your different uh, sci-fi styles, or say a few words, perhaps, about what the kind of text is of each of those? books you have in front of you. Mr. Beagle is a true genius fantasist who has a lyrical writing style that has been praised, and I'm not making this up, has been praised by many, he'll, you know, let me do it for you. And uh, uh, he, uh, uh, several of his books have been made into movies and none of them do the books justice. The books themselves are truly wonderful. Mr. Lupoff has the ability to write in almost any style you can imagine and has done it and has a tremendous amount of empathy for different kinds of people in different worlds and is a very fine writer. And I'm a genius. Look at that! That's the short version. Okay. Yes. And what about, you know, what about, um, kind of... Well, I think what we all write... Well, well, yeah, we, well, there is not... I'm saying we've, we were all old enough to have written in many different styles and I'm not sure who's got what here, so I can't really... Talk about it. Talk about, talk about mine. This is a book that I wrote many years ago. It's called the, uh, Mission Tank War. The guy that just reported to change the title for reasons of his own. It's about, uh, I did three books about an organization called War Incorporated that hire out to either cause or prevent wars depending on who's hiring them. And I think they're very amusing, which is kind of what I wrote them for. Uh, uh, Unicorn Girl is a fantasy that is an underground, I'm not making this up either, is an underground classic. It was part of a trilogy. It's one of the few books, uh, all three of them, where the protagonists in the book are the authors by name. I did it with a guy, that, the first one was called The Butterfly Kid by Chester Anderson, and he decided to make me the hero so that he wouldn't have to make up any names. So the two main characters in the book are Chester Anderson and Michael Curlin. And he dared me to continue the series, so I wrote The Unicorn <coughs> Girl, and the two heroes in that book are Michael Curlin and Chester Anderson. And the one Darcy <coughs> book is is set in an alternate universe where magic works that was originally created by a very good friend of mine, Randall Garrett. And when he got very sick and couldn't work, uh, I decided to take over the series. And people have honored me by saying that my books are as good as his, so I should really speak about that. Um, I'm not sure which of... These are, these are two collections. Um, the The <coughs> Secret History of Fantasy is a book for which I get credit as the editor the actual editor is sitting here, who simply didn't want his name on the cover, but who did the real heavy lifting, like, including choosing the stories, and they're excellent. It's a very good selection of modern fantasy, and some that aren't so modern. And I contributed my name and an article, foreword. But the Sleight of Hand collection is my most recent book, which it's a collection of short stories. I never expected to have four collections of stories out because I'm a slow writer. I figured damn things take so long, I might just as well write a novel anyway. Mm. And so for many years, my herb consisted of basically two novels and two long stories, maybe a couple of other things, but those were it. And in recent, in recent years, I've... <coughs> done an astonishing amount of short fiction, which just astonishes me as much as it does anyone. But the nearest thing I've got to a professional writing model of that sort is Samuel Johnson's line, depend upon it, sir, when a man knows that he is to be hanged within a week, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been writing to put bread on the table one way or another. I'm an English teacher in high school. 
Christian. We used to also Samuel Johnson. No one but a blockhead, right? Yeah, except for money. money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not true. Johnson spent a lot of time, you know, writing not profitable stuff. Right. Yeah, but he didn't, Don't we all? Did he intend it? I brought a, a whole lot of stuff. I, I overestimated uh, the requirements of the day. So I got this huge box with maybe 15 or 20 different titles in it. But the three that I put up here, Deep Space is, is, is a shortish novel with a couple of short stories tucked in to, to fill out the book. It deals with the exploration of the word cloud, which I had mentioned earlier. Tryon Man is kind of an odd book. I wrote it um, in the 1970s, and I thought it was a science fiction novel. I, I find, <coughs> rereading a lot of my earlier stuff, that it isn't what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. yes. And when this, this is a reissue that came out about four years ago, and my older son wrote a foreword to it. And he said, when I was a kid, uh, I thought this was a science fiction novel, and I have just reread it and I discovered it's not a science fiction novel at all. It's a psychological and moral study of uh, the struggles of a Holocaust survivor to maintain sanity. And I said, really? <laughs> and I reread the book, and, and he was right. I it's, it's, you that it's, well, see, you know, you're smart. most people are smarter than I am. <laughs> this, this one, this is a brand new book, it's a collection of short stories. Uh, there's a great deal of variety in there, science fiction, fantasy, a little bit of crime fiction, and also some mainstream fiction. At least that's what I think now. 20 years from now, if I'm still around and I pick up this book, I'll discover, no, no, it was really a first draft of a Hallmark greeting card. <laughs> <laughs> one never knows. I don't know how I ever got into a discussion. I did some years back with my children, of what exactly would go on my tombstone if I ever had one. It wasn't simply dropped over the side and buried at sea. And my son said that if he had a choice, he'd go for the phrase he heard most often as, as he was growing up. I must have said it a lot. The things I'll do for money never cease to amaze me. <laughs> Okay, buy books. Oh, yeah, buy books. <laughs>